lot to cover today. Luke. I'm sorry, Luke 24. Let's do 24. We'll do 19 later. 24. Last week at this time, I had just got back with a crew from uh, Arkansas, 1,100 miles. Then Wednesday night after church, uh, Brother David and I took off to Oklahoma City and uh, got there, left at 9 o'clock. I was going through Norman, Oklahoma at 3 a.m. That's what you can do when you ain't got to stop. <laughs> just giving you a heads up, okay? That's just... And uh, we just you know, we slowed down, threw some gas in it, kept going. And uh, had a tremendous time there at Pastor Rick Hawkins' conference. Gary Oliver was there. Bishop Gary McIntosh was there. Uh, so many old friends of mine was there. Tony Mason, some of you remember musician Tony Mason was there. Uh, we had a tremendous, tremendous time. I'll tell you more about that at the end of the service. But I'm saying that was another 1,100 miles in, in a 30-hour in a period that we ran. And... Uh, takes a day or two to get your legs back from all the traveling. feel like a trucker. And you're just moving through and getting things done. And camp yesterday out at the ranch, so things are happening. I have given you a little time to find. Last week, though, what I preached to you about, what we talked about uh, the little donkey that was wild and how that Jesus can get on something that's wild, and all of a sudden it, the wheel gives in. Sherry, happy 50. Uh, I, never mind, 49 years. I ain't going to say 58. That's wrong. That's wrong to say. But happy birthday. Amen. Glad, glad you finally, you went ahead of me a year. So thank you, Jesus. Amen. For so long, I felt like I was the oldest in so many ways around here. But, you know, when I, when I look at what, what we've been preaching, what we've been doing, and I mentioned to you last week that, that people who think God is so kind, so shy, and so tame haven't met the God of the Bible. You know, God's spirit broods and dances. He topples entire empires, sometimes overnight. He's the God of the Christ that looks big men in the eyes and says, follow me, and then walks away, not waiting for a reply. We talked about the donkey had never been ridden. The midweek, we dealt with prepare to walk, and we talked about out of Isaiah chapter 40. They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They shall run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. And so we dealt with preparing to walk, to make this walk with Christ. And so uh, this morning, I, I want to talk a little bit more about that. It is so easy to slip back into old habits. It's so easy to uh, allow yourself to go back to the way you used to think. And I've often said that a man with no future always reverts back to his past. That's why it's important to always see yourself in, in the future. And I don't know, the question has to be why. Why do we drift toward weariness to chronic spiritual fatigue being distant, become evasive. Why does our life in Christ so often gather moss instead of bearing fruit the way he asks us to do it? Uh, you got to ask yourself, why, why do others seem to not get stuck? Or how are they able to break free? And why, why, why is it that I can't? And I mentioned to you uh, in the midweek that the answer, and last Sunday, is for to you to learn to walk with him. If we walk with him, the scripture says we won't faint. To faint means to give up. To walk away, to get weary. And, I, and, and this has a, been a weary year. It's been a hard year. Uh, the flood hit. And then since then, guys, you know what's happened. You had Hurricane Michael hit Panama City. You had another hurricane hit the uh, southern coast. You got wildfires going on right now in the, in the Midwest. Uh, you know, you got people disgruntled over, you know, why is all these things happening? Let me tell you why they happen. They've never stopped happening. They've never stopped. We just moved into them. We moved near the coast. We moved near the woods. We've moved here. And the earth just keeps doing what the earth do. Amen. We just get caught in the aftermath of it. And we got to learn how to deal with it. And got to realize how big our God is. Can you get an amen? Amen. amen. Are you comfortable? When you stand, make sure you bend your knees a little bit. We got a lot of scripture to read. I don't want you to pass out or faint on me while we're standing. All right. But we're going to walk through some stuff very quickly here. Got a lot here. Luke chapter 24, verse 13. Now that same day, two of them, disciples... We're going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Now, I, I did a little study here, and I realized that these two disciples, they seem to be unnamed, except one does have a name. Uh, the name of him is Cleophas, and Cleophas is actually James's father. James was one of the early guys that was, well, he's the first disciple to die at the hands of Herod. 
Amen. He was martyred right off the bat with a sword, according to the book of Acts. I believe it is chapter 12. The other, we believe, is Luke, because we're reading out of the book of Luke, and he just doesn't name himself. He's just writing the story. And they were talking with each other about everything that had happened, and as they talked, they're walking and talking, and discussed these things with each other. Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. And it, there's some humor in here that I, I really don't want to jump into. But it's kind of funny. That two guys are walking. Talking about Jesus dying on the cross. Going into a, a tomb. And then they've heard a few rumors they believe. And now Jesus walks up next to them. Do you know he could be here right now and you don't recognize him? He could be right here next to you and you think, Oh, that's surely not. I thought that was a guest. Uh huh. That's why we're kind to our guest. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? Now, that's kind of rude to be asking two people. Why? He just popped in. What y'all talking about? You ever get in the elevator and look at two people and say, What y'all talking about? <laughs> I just want to get in on it. I just, I just want in on it. What y'all talking about? He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleophas, asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened here in these days? Jesus said, what things? Everybody say, what things? things? Say it again. What things, things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet. You know, you can't tell me that you don't like getting in somebody's presence and they not know who you are and then let them talk about you. Uh, what would they say? It happens to me at times. I'll get with people because I won't always admit I'm the pastor. Because I don't look like the pastor. They've heard of me. One girl sat down next to me at the conference. She said, I know of you. And she starts going through my past. I thought, how do you know me? I, got a, I was talking to my pastor this morning on the phone. He said, I looked on Facebook, saw you were in Oklahoma. I saw that God did some stuff and, and restored some relationships with you that you've been after for a while. How you know that? She knows my life. And so he looks on there, and he just begins to, to put two and two together by seeing what others say. So here they walk up, and Jesus, they, they, they begin to talk about it. They said he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priest and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped. Say that with me. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all that took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us what they had seen, a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb, and they found it just as the woman had said. But him, they did not see. Verse 25, he said to them, how foolish you are. Foolish literally means dull of heart. I'm not calling you a fool. I just mean you're slow. <laughs> Can you handle that in this PC world? You're just a little slow. You ain't catching it real quick. You got a few blonde roots showing there. <laughs> he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses... Genesis and all the prophets he explained to them what he what was said in the scriptures concerning himself as they approached the village to which they were going Jesus acted as if he were going further but they urged him strongly stay with us for it is nearly evening the day is almost over so he went to stay with them when he was at the table watch this he has explained that this Jesus y'all talking about is in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and begins to walk through the Word of God, and they still haven't recognized Him. They still hadn't figured out who this cat is, other than he's extremely educated. When he was at the table with him, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were open, and they recognized Him, and He disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while we talked, while he talked with us on the road and he opened the scriptures to us? I, it's like saying this. I thought that was him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, you know, I know you didn't catch it, but I felt in my spirit something was up. I felt Jesus. I felt Je- I felt Jesus right there. I, when he started talking, I, but I just didn't want to say it first. 
Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I was going to let you do it. But when he broke the bread, you know, there are people in your life who have gone, and you'll see somebody, a grandchild, start doing something, and you say, you acting like Papa. Right. I see Papa in you. Jesus had certain mannerisms. And when they saw it, they said, this is, that's got to be him. And as soon as they did, he took off. And they got excited. said, did not our hearts. Father, you know one of our problems today as I pray is our hearts have become dull. Our hearts have become hard. Our hearts have forgot what it was like to have an experience with you. My heart, my prayer, God, is that you would expose yourself to us in such a way that not only through Scripture but through revelation and understanding, we grasp it again and our hearts begin to burn. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. What uh, you sung a song, the, the band sung a song and used the word mysteries. I don't know if you caught that. All through scripture, Jesus shared about mysteries. And one of the things that we've learned is this that, that a mystery is not, God is not trying to hide things from you, He's hid things for you. You didn't catch that. I said, God's not hiding things from you, He's hiding things for you, for only you to find. And I found through life, you know, when you deal with the kids, you hide things at times. You're not hiding it from them. You're hiding it for them so that they can find it. And I pray on your journey with God, you begin to find things that you never dreamed before. They start coming true. It's been a stressful week, a stressful week for the disciples. Think about it. Well, one, they had pinned their hopes on and dreams on Jesus, had been falsely arrested, accused, beaten, and unbelievably crucified. They rolled the stone, and they thought it was over, and then, then they heard he had risen. How much more could they take? Discouraged and confused, they, they begin to head for home. They're walking away, these two men, Luke and Cleophas. And as they're walking away, they, 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 Jesus comes right up next to them. The tomb is empty. Christ is risen. And two of the disciples now heading home, and, and, and they get interrupted. Luke 24 says, as they, as they were talking and walking with each other about everything that happened, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, other Jesus came up and walked along with him this is something we need more and more of is to learn to walk with him not only ride the wild but here to learn just to walk with him they that walk shall not faint if I walk with him slow first our hearts are slow I I remember first getting involved in the things of God it was like my heart was just didn't catch I was trying to catch it but the more you walk with it then your heart starts burning the scripture says we're not our hearts burning within us we say it over and over here your genesis will determine your revelation How you start will be how you finish. And here, their heart was a little bit slow to believe. It was dull, the Greek language. It was beginning to callous. Well, the hardest thing about pastoring to me is, first off, keeping my heart soft through all the hits and the things that go, but also trying to help you keep your heart soft. And help you understand that in life, it's easy to backslide. It's easy to get to a place where you don't care no more. It's easy when you hear this fire and this hurricane and this problem that problem that you won't throw your hands and say, I can't do it anymore. But I'm telling you, that's not the will of God. You've got to keep your heart soft. You've got to be able to be touched with other people's tears. You've got to be able to be affected. That's why I love testimonies of people. Dusty, when you tell me that in 09 I got to pray for you and you were in a coma, I, that, that, I, I look back and I say, Lord, I thank you that I've been 39 years as a yesterday I've been born again 39 years I've been doing this thing man and I'm going to tell you the hardest the hardest part is keeping your heart right because you it gets and how do you get a hard heart you've heard too much and you've done too little you hear here 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 and you hear the gospel on Sunday and Tuesday and over and over through the week and you listen to the radio and you hear gospel gospel but you don't do anything with it And if you don't do anything with it, your heart starts hardening up and you start getting callous. And you'll say stuff like this, oh, I remember when. I remember when my heart was on fire like that. Don't worry. All you got to do is stay in the church a little while and you'll be like me. I don't want that. Can I get an amen? amen? I don't want that at all. He explained to them. The scripture says, and beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them. That word is hermeneutics. It's the study of biblical interpretation. It's to look at scripture and see sheep and know that he's talking about himself and about us. To look at lions and know that he's talking about himself and then us. To look at it and be able to interpret it properly. Hermeneutics. It's not a, it's not a bad word. It's something I learned. You know, you, there are times you've got to look at scripture and break it down. You got to see what it's really talking about. And his manners opened their minds. Not only did he begin to talk with them, but now his manners, he acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly to stay. That was what Jesus did. 
The boat was in the water. The disciples were in it. And the Bible says that he, it, if you read it in the book of Mark, it says he was going to pass by them. He often acted as if he was just going to keep going. I wonder why. You know why, why I believe? Because many of us, we want to be cajoled and, 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 and babied and come and look at me. And every now and then Jesus said, really, if you want me, you seek me. You want me, come get me. You want more of me, dig in my word. You want to hang out with me, then talk to me, doggone. No, he may not say doggone. <laughs> talk with me. Be with me. He was just going to keep right on going. And, and there's something about that. Then that you knew that was that had to be him. After he broke the bread, their eyes were open. Luke knew of this. He knew that how he broke the bread and prayed over. You, you know, you ever been with somebody who's doing something that nobody else is doing? And you say, surely, who else was praying over the food? Right. Who started that? Where did that come from? When they got with Jesus, though he was the maker of the wheat... And the creator of the sunshine, and the one that brought the rain, he still looked at it and said, I give you thanks for this food. Let me think. See, when we, we're not praying asking God to keep the germs away from us. We're giving God thanks for the food. We thank you. I had a brother-in-law once that every time he'd buy groceries, he'd bring them in, put them on the table, gave, prayed over all the food, and gave God thanks for them right then so he didn't have to pray over any other meal. I call that Lazy. Amen. I'm going to give God thanks for that food. I want to give him an appreciation that he provided for that. He did all that for us. He broke the bread, and their eyes were open. As soon as that happened, their eyes were Imagine their astonishment as, as their eyes and they went, you're just, and before they could get Zeus out, he was gone. In a blink, he disappeared. Hey, I'm, I'm, and, and, and all of a sudden, one of them said, Did, didn't I feel, you, you ever ate something in your heart, get that heartburn? Huh? I'm talking about you get heartburn. The Bible says, did not our hearts Burn within us. When did it burn within you? When we walked with him and after we ate the bread with him. Sometimes you'll eat something spiritual and it won't let you go. I've heard people say, I stayed up all night last night. I had a pepperoni pizza and I just stay. I, let me give you a real quick true story. When I first started preaching, I was preaching a, a revival in, uh, off airline in Baton, Baton Rouge for a man named Jimmy Barus. And Jimmy took me out. I was preaching there on a Wednesday night. I was in college. And then I was heading over to Channel View, Texas, to preach a, a, a Terry a Friday. I see Terry here. You were probably there when I was a young puppy with no hair on my face. And on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I had a revival. I was so excited about it. But I preached for Jimmy on Wednesday. And I was so nervous, man. I was like 20, 22 years old. And I, was, I got this revival coming up. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm scared about it and nervous all at the same time. And I went out with Jimmy Barus after preaching Wednesday night, had a great time there, and we ate pepperoni pizza. And I thought it was going to be my last pepperoni pizza I would ever eat the rest of my life. I went down to the Kroger's, and I got, uh, I got everything in the antiacid aisle that I could find. I'm serious. It was midnight. I couldn't sleep. Something was keeping me up. I mean, I was burping. You don't know what I'm talking about. I mean, I'm struggling. They call that flux now. It's just, uh, and, and, and it just really kind of irritates. Couldn't sleep. And then I was a mess when I got over to Channel View on Thursday night. And Friday started preaching. And, you know, it ain't nothing like preaching when you're sick and you still don't know what you're doing. Something always happens in my life when I'm not feeling well and I get behind the pulpit, God heals me. It's happened my whole life. I can come in here snotting and coughing and kicking. And if I get here, I'm well. It makes me not want to quit preaching. You just walk, I'm serious. I want to preach for hours because I'm feeling good. Because when you quit, it just starts hitting again. I finished that revival. They put it in the bulletin on a Sunday. Come here, Brother Jerry's unique preaching style. Being from Alabama, I was a little different than these Texicans were. And so I, I preached, and when I finished, I, I was on my way to college in San Antonio. I'm listening to my favorite radio preacher, Paul Harvey. He dead now. Paul's telling the rest of the story, talking about it. And he said, uh, I was puffed up, man. I was, I was excited. I was a model preacher. You know what a model is? It's a small replica of the real thing. I was, thinking, I was thinking I was all that. And he said, uh, and, and then I, I, I said, unique. They call me unique. I'm unique. Ha, 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 ha. Unique. I'm a unique preacher. 
Paul Harvey said, if you don't know whether to call something good or bad, call it unique. <laughs> Let's get off that rabbit. Let me come back over here. Heartburn. Heartburn. Did not, there are times spiritually you will catch and digest something that your heart begins to burn. You'll get a revelation. Like, like, like Peter said, when thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, heartburn. Did not our hearts burn within us when he began to talk from beginning to end? After he broke the bread, something was going on inside. Our hearts were dull. We were walking away. How do you get a word that he resurrected? How do you get a word that the women saw angels, and yet you're walking away on the road to Emmaus? You're walking away from the greatest thing it's ever taken place and Jesus just pops up next to you how did he know we were talking he hears what you're saying uh-huh yeah oh you know she did uh-huh excuse me somebody just popped in my kitchen yes sir can I help you be careful he listening Amen. Walk right up there next to him. Butt it in. Hey, what y'all talking about? Oh, you ain't heard? Jesus, this guy named Jesus, died on the cross, put him in the grave. Next thing we heard, he resurrected something. All our hopes, all our hopes, our hope of a resurrection, our hope of heaven, our hope of a future, everything was in him. Now it's gone, it's gone, it's gone. And he began to talk to them. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Luke chapter 22, verse 44. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And he opened their minds. And I'm, I'm a little against some of this open-minded, crazy stuff I'm hearing, uh, you know, that, that's been spewed on north and, uh, excuse me, on east and west coast. It's, it's some crazy things. But then there's some biblical things your mind has been close to you 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 closed your mind you got a little theology when you were young and you said to yourself that's the way it's going to be i'm only going to be this way all the time rest of my life i'm going to stay this way uh, we had a young boy in our church, raised up in our church. He's going to a Catholic college uh, to play football. He, he went through the line. That there was communion. He knows about communion. He came up. He, he, he got his cracker. He got his juice. And he started heading back to seat. The nun chased him down and said, you got to eat that up here at the altar. He said, not the way I was raised. We all took it together like the Scripture said. They stopped the service to make him eat his cracker. He told me the story. His daddy told me the story. We, we get just enough theology to shut our mind. Now, I'm going to step all over you little brains here with this thought. Don't, don't take that to me. Well, Pastor, I was told when I was little, if I gave my life to Jesus, I could live any way I want, and I'm still going to heaven. Well, shut down. Your brain shut down. I can do anything I want. I can do anywhere, go anywhere, do anything. I want saved, always saved. I'll never be unsaved. I'm not arguing with you. I hope you always stay saved. I hope you do the right thing. In fact, you're here this morning. It tells me you want something more. But our brains get shut up talking to people on the Internet right now. <laughs> if I get the Holy Ghost, all I got to do is talk in tongues one time, and I never have to talk in tongues again, and I got it. No, that ain't what Scripture says. You speak to God in heavenly languages, so you need to keep using that language. That's your prayer language. Doesn't mean you have to spout out loud and scare everybody. Well, if I just get baptized, I'll be saved. If I get baptized, I'll be saved. All I got to do is get dunked, and I'll be saved. If that was true, then the thief on the cross went to hell. He didn't get off to get baptized. Right? See, see, Jesus, that's the great thing about the Scripture. He's always challenging your theology, always challenging it. Uh, you know what else challenges your theology? Your children. Man, I meet parents, they, 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 they sticklers, you know. They, you, you, if anything happens in your marriage and you go through a divorce, you're not welcome back under my table. Next thing you know, they go through a rough spell, maybe a divorce. The next thing, you've done set the line up to never let your child come back into your house. What her fault, he was the idiot or vice versa. You hear what I'm saying? We do things. We, we, and so he opened up their minds. <laughs> And he began to pour in himself. And he began to tell them. Go, keep going through scripture, sis. I don't know where I'm at. There it is. There it is. He, 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 so he begins to tell them. Guys, in Genesis, I'm the seed 
that will crush Satan's head. In Exodus, I'm the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, I'm an atoning sacrifice. In Numbers, I'm the bronze serpent that was lifted up to the sky when 126,000 people died because they, they did not serve God correctly. And Moses held it up and he said, look at the serpent, you live. And by the way, it's still your medical sign now. When you look at all your little medical signs, you got the cross and the serpent on. Is that right? Forget it. We always thought it's an atheistic world and yet we got God everywhere and don't even know it. Amen. Numbers, he's a bronze serpent. Deuteronomy, He's the promised prophet. He's coming again. Keep rolling, sis. And Joshua, he's a warrior with a sword. When, when Joshua said, Lord, I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. And all of a sudden, an angel shows up with a sword. And Joshua said, you for me or against me? That's a mean talk there, Joshua. You want to talk about an angel. But that's who he was. He stood there and said, I'm here to take over. Just follow me. In Judges, he's our deliverer. In Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. In Samuel, in Kings, in the Chronicles, he's the promised king. He begins to walk in through Scripture. And Ezra and Nehemiah. He's the restorer of the nation. He builds the walls back in your life. And Esther, he's our advocate. We don't have somebody that's, that's telling on us. We got somebody that's for us, that's always talking to God and saying, help them, forgive them. My blood's got them. And Job, he's our redeemer. He reminds us that he's coming again. He's got us. In Psalms, he's our all in all. In Proverbs, he's our pattern and wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he's our goal. In the Song of Solomon, our beloved, all the minor prophets, he's the coming prince of peace. Keep rolling. In Matthew, he said, God, I'm the king. In Mark, the servant. In Luke, the son of man. In John, the son of God. In Acts, he's Christ ascended, seated, and sending. All the letters of the epistles, he's Christ indwelling, filling. In the book of Revelation, he's Christ returning and reigning. Opened up their heads and poured it in. Did not our hearts burn? Oh, I'm praying for heartburn. I'm praying that our, if you have an experience with him, it changes everything. Somebody said, Pastor, how, how are we going to reach these millennials? When, when, when I'm, and I'm not talking about these snowflakes. I'm talking about real millennials. I'm talking about, you know, snowflakes, they get offended at everything. Uh, but I'm talking, about, I'm talking about this generation. I was just up there at that conference, and I saw preachers wearing skinny jeans and funny shoes and you know, they my age, and uh, and uh, their wife's blouse, and, and uh, oh, their hair, their hair pumped up like that. I said, dear God, if I tried that in our church, uh, <laughs> well, you wouldn't like me as much, I'm sure. You know, I just, and I tried on a pair of skinny jeans once. I really did. It didn't make me look skinny at all. But just, you know, and I talk with my kids all the time because they're part of that generation. I said, Lord, how are we going to do it? And it was like nobody could really give me an answer except we got to relate to them. we got to connect. And I'll be dead before I can relate to, to much of the stuff that I hear going on. But I do know one thing. I was part of a hippie generation. And my generation said the same thing. How are we going to relate to these long hair, bell-bottom wearing, dingo shoes, uh, Shirt button, unbuttoned down to their belly button, wearing chains around their neck. And, you know, this. thank God I was before the disco era. When then I'm in the 60s and 70s, you know, we're moving through. And my, my parents look at me and say, I don't understand your music. I don't understand why you're acting. I don't understand. And, you know, and they went, and I, I'm the same parent now looking at my kids doing it. And I'm going, dear God, what's wrong? And then just like my parents looked at me, and they didn't understand me and my friends. What, what is the one thing that can help Joseph this generation other than me trying to relate to them by looking like them and listening to their music? One thing, experience. If they have an experience with Jesus, if I keep having experiences with Jesus, if I can keep walking with Jesus, get up here with your skinny jeans on. <laughs> if, I could, if I could just have... So my prayer is simply this. God, let them have an experience. Let this generation have it. Let my generation have it, the older, the younger. Let us keep having an experience with you. Let us keep walking with you. Our hearts have been slow. They've been dull. They've been beaten up. Some have gone through tremendous uh, stresses in life. What do we need more than anything? An experience. I just want an experience with you. I want, to, I want to walk with you. Now, I only have a little bit of time left, so stand with me. 
If, if in, in your heart right now you say, Pastor, uh, I can just tell you right now, my heart's been dull, and I want the fire back in my life. I want you to step out in the middle aisle. You don't have to come up here. Just step out in the middle aisle. Just step out here in the aisle. Just step out in the aisle. Tell somebody, excuse me, excuse me. Just step out in the aisle. Just step out in the aisle. There you go. Just step out in the aisle. You, your heart's been a little slow. Just step out in the aisle. See, I, I see this so much in life. That life has begun to take away. and it's, it's pulled from you. It's pulled from you and pulled from you. We're going to walk with God. We're going to walk with Him. You can't change your son. Only God can. You can keep walking with Him. An experience with you. Now, those in the aisle, just keep your hands down. But those on the outside, with your eyes closed, your hands stretched toward them. We're going to believe God that a, this a new fire will come back up inside of them. That God will heal and touch and minister to them in the name of Jesus. I thank you, God, for an experience with you. Lord, to walk with you, to talk with you. Sister Kathy, God give you a, an experience again with him. That he'd wrap himself around you. That there'd be change in your life in such a way that you will feel the heartburn. You'll feel the fire again. Father, in the name of Jesus. New fire. Fresh fire. God, a new beginning. Lord, let us see you in Scripture. Let us see you in Scripture. God, only you can heal broken hearts. God, in the name of Jesus, let us see you in the Word of God. Let us find ourselves there walking with you on the road. Let our hearts be excited about turning back toward you. Lord, there is nothing my sister needs more than you right now. There's nothing that can fill her than you can. God, I thank you in the name of Jesus for a fresh experience. God, for this beautiful couple, for a fresh experience in you once again in their life. God, to drive things from them. God, has been harming them. God, there's a servant heart in both of them. I thank you, Lord. It has not gone unseen. Lord, just like them two disciples, you've walked with them. They didn't see it. They didn't recognize you at the time. But, God, you've been there. I thank you, God, in the name of Jesus. Let us experience you more and more. God, for my friend Dave. God, I thank you, Lord. God, you took uh, the love of his life. She left. That's where I met him. God, he's a man's man. I pray in the name of Jesus that you fill this Marine with your presence. That you touch his life once again. That you give him a burning desire to use the rest of his life for you. God, that he would begin to reach and teach and talk. Lord, there's a, there's, a, there's a fierceness about him. God, in the name of Jesus, that change is coming. Dave, change is coming in your life. It ain't, you're not getting here in retirement. That's not the issue, my friend. Amen. You're, you're, you're entering the time of refiring, not retiring. There's refiring going on in you. In Jesus' name. God, a rekindling, a rekindling in my brother. God, that you not just touch his eyes, Lord, but you touch his heart. God, that you open the eyes of our heart. God, that we may see again. That we may see the reason that you put us here on earth. I thank you, God, in the name of Jesus for an experience with you. I see it coming in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. It wasn't just baptism. It was the fire of God you wanted to put in my sister. Lord, not just to be a mother or wife, but to be your servant. God, in the name of Jesus, use these hands for your glory. Use these hands for your glory. God, may she reach and touch and bless and help and strengthen. I give you praise for an experience with you. There's nothing like it can, it can change my life again. Touch your God. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. Kyle, in the name of Jesus, I lift you up, my friend. You've reached to help and some have slapped your hands away. God, I pray in the name of Jesus for open doors. I pray for learning and understanding. I pray for management. God, all the things that keeps this fire alive. God, that doesn't have to be a tragedy to do it. God, in the name of Jesus, as he walks with you, talk to him. As he walks with you, open up his ears. As he walks with you, talk to him. You didn't hide anything from him. You hid things for him. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, come on, give God one of your best praises right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, give him your best praise right now. Hallelujah. God, bring hope back in our life. Bring hope back in our life. We had hope. We had hope. If you keep reading the scripture, it says they turned around and ran. 
They went from walk to run, ran back, went in the house, told the disciples, you ain't going to believe what we just saw, who we just talked to, who we just had bread with. Okay, they just ate bread. If you keep reading it in Luke 24, then Jesus shows up in the room. So he disappeared on the road, shows up in the room. And I love this part out of the message. He says, you got any leftover fish? You know, it ain't always all spiritual. But he showed me with a resurrected body, we're still going to be eating leftovers. <laughs> Amen. He sat up there and talked with him. Oh, it's an amazing story. I love the gospel. There's no other story like it. Be seated for a brief moment. Since we're fixing to transition into that pastor's, uh, if I get our servant leaders to come up. Oh, from slow to burning, sorrow to hope. I see, I used this, go back to that one slide, uh, Rand, if you would. I used this one expression last week as we traveled on the bikes and people were, it was cold, it was wet, and we were hurting. And I kept saying, it will be what you endure that expresses how deeply you desire. And it's funny, that popped to me, and it's what I've been preaching the last two weeks. Seriously, it will be what you endure, how you keep walking with him, how you keep believing that your heartburn again will start up and express how much you desire. Well, over the last year, we endured more than I expected I could ever endure. We uh, go to that pastor's video, if you will, that... This is, uh, I'm at a conference, David and I will walk in and we sit down. And honestly, guys, let me be honest. I did it for Pastor Rick. I love him. He called me. He texted me. He said, man, I got a, uh, having our first conference here. I got preachers coming from all over, but you've been, you know, one of my closest friends for over 30 years. He said, uh, I wish you'd come. I said, well, I can't leave Tuesday night. I can't leave Wednesday night. I've been gone. To Cancun for a wedding and St. Louis preached for my pastor. I, I can't, I just can't see myself leaving. I said, I tell you what, I'll, I'll come up Wednesday night after church. That's crazy, I know. And I, that really shows you just how much I love that guy and how much I appreciate him because he, he's been a part of helping me through life in so many ways. So I get up there and we get in this meeting and look over and there's Bishop Gary McIntosh, which all of you know. There's Pastor Rick and there's a Pastor Dick Burnell from a very large church out in um, San Jose who just turned his church over as a pastor. He retired, turned it over to a guy named Ron Carpenter who's out of South Carolina, and this guy, John Gray, who was preaching for John uh, Joel Osteen, left and went and took his church in South Carolina, and Rick managed all this stuff while taking a new church there in Norman, Oklahoma. So I, I commend him. But I was sitting there, and... And Pastor Rick says, and y'all know about this about me, I've been looking for a place to pay it forward. When South Carolina got hit, I thought it was going to South Carolina. We, we helped finance a group that went out there to help do some work, Craftsman for Christ. Then the hurricane, when it hit Florida, I said, well, that's a totally different hurricane that hit us. You know, we got wet, but they got spanked. I mean, we could remodel buildings we lost a couple maybe, but we could remodel them. But our trees are still here. Our roads are still here. And then, so, but I didn't know because it happened and they moved to the next tragedy. And you know what it's like. You don't get no coverage no more. Nobody knows. So I'm sitting, I'm listening to this pastor, and it's like I'm looking at myself. It's been one month. October the 11th is when Hurricane Michael hit. It's been one month. This is what, if you look at it, that's what Panama City looked like before the hurricane. This is what it looked like after the hurricane. Same picture. Go to the next slide. This is the community in Panama City. Fifty churches were destroyed in Panama City. Fifty. Okay. Look at the blue chair. This is just one street. And there you can see the trees are all gone. The power uh, people are there. This is the church that the pastor was pastoring. And let me, let me just give you a quick story here. He's underneath the stage with his nine-year-old daughter, and the hurricane hits. And she asked, his da asked her dad, Dad, am, are we going to die today? And he said, not today. 
We won't die today. Go to the next slide. This is Pastor John Ramsey. When he told me, uh, when he began to tell the story, Pastor Rick looked at it, and he says, and he, we're, if we're 50 pastors in there, he says, 40, 50, right, David, wouldn't you think? And, and, and he said, we're going to raise $30,000 to help him out. Well, I can tell you this. We've spent 400000 400000 just getting us back. And you see the size of his building. Go to the next slide. This is his sanctuary before and after. And you can see what it did to the top. When I saw the inside of that church, it reminded me of the inside of our church as the chairs were all swirled around and, of course, everything started. And then I see that this is his first view when he came out from under the pulpit, under the platform. This is what he saw of his church. And just, just hold there, sis. So I'm sitting there, and you, I just well up. My heart catches on fire. And I, I interrupted the whole meeting. And I said, I've been looking for you. I've been looking for you. I didn't know if I'd find you in South Carolina or California. I didn't know where I'd find you. But I've been looking for you. And before I could, I, 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 you know, you think before you talk. So I know I thought it because I said it immediately. I said, I'm, we're going to send you $10,000. And he starts crying. Then Pastor Rick looks at me and he goes, We'll match that with another 10. And next thing you know, 30,000 went like that. And then that night, so this thing started it started rolling, man, for this guy. And, and you know, immediately when you tell somebody I don't give you 10,000, you're friends. <laughs> the honest to God, I walked out of the meeting, didn't even look for him. I was headed down, Joseph, to down to the green room. And somebody said, hey, Pastor, uh, John's looking for you. He wants to talk to you. I said, he'll find me. He'll find me. And we got together, and I said, listen, we're not going to, what I want to do here is to tell you this. I'm not raising money for him. We're taking a tithe off of what we have in the bank. You follow where I'm going? I've done this before, Cheryl. I've taken 10% of what, what I know we got in checking, and, uh, and we don't have it. But I'll, I'll pull some back out of savings or a CD or something to get it there, and then I'll scare uh, the secretary because she's already nervous. And I'll take a tithe, and I will do and tell you what I've been preaching here for 25 years, that there's something about a tithe. We already give toward our missions and all that, but we're going to take 10000 and I'm going to send it to that man. I, I, I remember one time years ago, I had, we had $40,000 in the bank, Susan, and, and a, a church worship center from downtown Houston came in, and I began to talk with just a group of pastors. And I saw the work they were doing and how they were reaching people and doing things. And I looked at our, our, our administrator then. I said, how much we got in the bank? He said, 40000 I said, take four and send it to them. And people think, you're crazy. No. Immediately our finances jumped, and what you see out on the freeway is the seed from that. So I'm telling you, I know how this works. But I'm not doing it to get. I'm doing it to be a blessing. And then I said, John, what else you need? He said, well, you mean? I said, what else you need? He said, well, we got to move portable buildings in. I have a Christian school. Matter of fact, he said, I have a Christian school. He said, and uh, all of our employees are right now are out of work. So we're going to be moving modular buildings in, and we got to put decks around them. And I thought, decks? We can put decks in. We can build. We can drop four before in the ground and throw a one by 12 on them, can't we, Joseph? Brace them up. I said, tell me when. And I'll get a crew together, and we'll come down, and we'll, we'll build whatever we can build for you. Amen. But uh, one thing's for sure. I don't want to just put money in your pocket. I want to connect with you. I want our church to know that Harvest Worship Center in Panama City was blessed because of you and what you got started. So this is what he wrote. This is, I, uh, I found this. Listen to this. It sounded like me. Almost a month has passed on Hurricane Island. Panama City is still a war zone. Mountain of trees line the roadways. Traffic still congested as work crews work to clear utilities and restore services. If you have a home, you likely have power. However, many thousand homes and buildings that, ho the, that, ha that house businesses were lost. The lack of structure make day-to-day -day li life difficult. About half of all grocery stores, gas stations, and banks are still closed we were the ones able to open, only offering limited services. Schools opened yesterday, offering half days and shared campuses. What is most difficult is the outside world has forgotten we are here. And that's how we felt, that the outside world had forgotten we are here. Uh, 
No, very little or national news coverage. Panama City and the Florida Panhandle need your help. Our homes, our churches, and our schools have been destroyed. All 19 of my employees lost their jobs until we can reopen. Many businesses have suffered the same fate. We're working hard to reopen our preschool, and we are having services outside until we can repair our temporary sanctuary. All of these tasks take place with limited resources, so no Internet. We knew that. No, no, very little phone service. And the employees were turned down for disaster unemployment many times. They reapplied three or four times. When I talk to FEMA agents, they say, we qualify, but when we apply the same old government red tape, it always is. People are homeless, tired, and frustrated. Help us if there's any way you can. So I read this, and I think, that's not like us. We're still dealing with it. Still dealing with it. And, you know, if your home wasn't, you were still affected by us. So I'm not asking you to give toward this. We're already going to give that. I'm just asking you to be faithful with your tithe and your offering. Amen. So that we can do. You know, this is what we do. It ain't about us trying to save money. It's about us trying to in the right place to sow seed into. Amen. So if you need to tie the offering envelope, lift your hand. Our servant leader is coming to you. David has the rest of the net. Well, you, can you do it? Okay. Hey, walk with him this week. Walk with him this week. Talk with him this week. Open that Bible up and say, Lord, I know you hid something in here for me. And begin to look in it till you find it. Amen. You need these? Yeah, give me some of that soft stuff. I hope everybody is well today. I hope that that message meant something for you. As me and Pastor drove this week, we had an opportunity to just talk about different things, and and that was something that we had talked about. Just our hearts burning again. Uh, one one issue that I, I can promise you, Joseph probably feels the same way, is doing what we do can become very monotonous. It can become very uh, ordinary. And so we have to, uh, one of the, the things I know that I struggle with a lot is, is just becoming complacent. If we're not careful, we can definitely become complacent. And that's everybody. That's not just pastors. That's, that's life. November 11th, we have a swap meeting, Seniors with a Purpose. Uh, that's today. Following the Crosby Campus service, see Linda and Ken Rich, which are right here. If you guys don't know us, her, how, would, how would you describe that? Your your ministry. Okay. Uh, I mean, who, who's invited? Okay. Amen. It's open to anybody. Fifty and over is, is what they gear toward. But again, if you if you just looking to study some word, I know they're doing a good job at that. Uh, November seventeenth, Jewels for Christ. Saturday, ten a.m. to one p.m. Uh, seeing Miss Diane Spurlock, is Miss Miss Diane's right here. She got her hand lifted. Uh, that's for anybody, uh, for the ladies that would like to just get touch. Again, any opportunity to connect with the Father is an opportunity for our hearts to burn again. So I, I pray that you guys get in touch with Miss Diane. November eighteenth, lift ladies and fellowship together. Um, see Miss Diane Feeling. Uh, she is right there. There she is, Miss Diane. Charlie, it's good to see you, brother. I'm glad you're here today. Looking good, too. <laughs> <He's> a, <laughs> uh, November 20th and the 21st, uh, no service for Thanksgiving. Um, Pastor, just uh, he's going to take off and go to uh, uh, Alabama, see Mama. Again, he doesn't know how many more Thanksgivings he's going to have the opportunity to spend with Mama. So uh, we encourage him to do that. Just have a good time and enjoy your mom. Amen. And not only that, just have a good Thanksgiving, guys, as we go through the holidays. We're going to keep you posted on which days we're having service, which days we're not. Uh, December 8th, I know this is a big deal. Um, our annual Christmas party is Hobo Christmas. Uh, guys, come out. It's, this is December 8th at New Caney Campus. It doesn't say what time. Does it happen to say up there? No. It starts at 5? Okay. We're, we're going to say 5, and then they'll correct us later if not. Uh, so that's December 8th, guys. Uh, it's a big deal, uh, and he's going to let you know who he has uh, as a special guest this year coming in. Today we're believing God for 
Jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. Water you turn into wine You open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine And out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you not like you our god is greater our god is stronger god you are higher than any other our god is healer awesome in power our god our god And into the darkness you shine And out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power, our God, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God.